Welcome to the Global News Podcast, your source for the latest and most comprehensive coverage of global events, breaking news, and in-depth analysis. We are here to guide you through the top stories from around the world. Whether it's politics, economics, culture, or science. Two years since Russia's full-scale invasion, a rallying cry from Ukraine's president. None of us will allow our Ukraine to end. In the future, next to the word Ukraine, the word independent will always stand. Alexei Navalny's body is handed to his mother after a battle with Russian authorities. And the UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees halts aid deliveries to northern Gaza, claiming those starving are trying to take aid from passing trucks. Also in this podcast, a politician in Britain's governing Conservative Party is suspended for anti-Muslim comments against the Mayor of London. And... What you're doing there, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, have a claim on 20 years. What you need to do is, is follow through a lot quicker than what you're doing there right now. No to mansplaining how teaching golf to a female professional has caught the attention of millions. President Zelensky has issued a rallying cry to the people of Ukraine on the second anniversary of Russia's full-scale invasion. He said Ukrainians would win the war but stressed it must end on our terms and with what he called a just peace. A number of Western leaders, including the head of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, travelled to Kiev to show solidarity. Our correspondent there, James Waterhouse, sent this. It's been two years of change and upheaval for Ukraine, and this is a very different war from 2022. As both sides continue to mobilise thousands of men, it is the invaders making their size count by advancing in several areas of the front line. Unlike Moscow, Kiev can't keep its economy on a total war footing and is, as ever, reliant on Western help. A number of Western leaders came to Kiev today to show their support, they visited the Hostomel Air Base, where Russian paratroopers first tried to land two years ago. President Zelensky praised the people of Ukraine. I am incredibly proud of each of you. I admire each of you. I believe in each of you. Any normal person wants the war to end, but none of us will allow our Ukraine to end. Italy's Prime Minister, Giorgio Maloney, also spoke. Here we are today to say thanks to those men and women who on the 24th of February two years ago did not run away and instead fought for themselves, for their families, for what they hold most dear. This place is the symbol of Moscow failure. But there was an important omission. Unlike last year, neither President Biden nor anyone from the White House visited Ukraine's capital for this year's anniversary. What is more concerning for Kyiv is the sizeable $60 billion military package still blocked in Washington. Today was a significant show of commitment and unity from Ukraine's allies. But the worry for Ukraine is whether this will be matched by the US beyond its upcoming election. James Waterhouse there. Well, as the Biden administration struggles to get that multi-billion dollar aid package approved in Washington, Estonia's Prime Minister has urged leaders to bolster support for Ukraine. In a striking warning, Kaya Kallas said the war could spread very fast in Europe and called on Ukraine's allies to do their utmost to help. Our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, asked Oleg Danilov, the Secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defence Council, if he was worried that they won't get the money from the United States. The 60 billion US aid we are counting on will come to us sooner or later, but there is a question over whether everything will be done on time. If you don't do something on time, then keep it in mind that it will cost you a lot later. European countries, they're worried about the possibility that President Trump could return to office. President Trump, who is known to have an affinity with President Putin, has said he would end the Ukraine war in days. Are you also worried about this possibility? Concerning the election of the President of the United States, this is the business of the Americans. They have the right to elect such a president as they deem necessary. The problem is that no one knows how Trump will behave. This is the situation. 
But I want to emphasize something very important. We think that Putin will try to resolve the, our issue before the election of the next US president. He will not risk leaving the issue of our territory for later, given who will be the next president. President Zelensky has warned that if you don't get the American aid, you'll lose the war. It is very dangerous to make such statements for our society. President Zelensky, as a president of our country, is naturally very worried about this, because he is responsible for all Ukraine. Russian forces recently took Advitka. They're now pressing in at least five directions. It's being said that the ratio is now a seven to one in terms of Russian personnel and weaponry. Are you outnumbered and outgunned on the front lines? We ask our partners in the West and the European Union help us with weapons so that you do not have to fight with Russia yourselves. Russia's task is not only to destroy our nation. Russia's task is to break up the European Union. There is a threat to Russia, and they know it. It is much easier to them to negotiate separately with each country. This is Putin's goal. Oleg Danilov speaking to Lise Doucette about the challenges his country's facing as Ukraine enters the third year of the war. Well, let's turn now to Russia. How have things changed there since Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine? Alexander Baunov is the editor-in-chief of the Russia and Eurasia programme at the think tank the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in the US. He spoke to James Kumarasamy. Putin is waging war on two fronts. One is against Ukraine, another is against the citizens of its own country. In these two years, Russia became from a modern sort of dictatorship, smart dictatorship, dictatorship in disguise with institutions, uh, controlled elections, uh, controlled media, into a full-scale classical-style dictatorship of fear, repressions, and terror. And it's not impossible to ignore when you are inside the country. And how does that become reflected on individuals, on individual level, if you like? Very simple. Russian citizens used to have some rights, the right to protest and to take on the streets. All 20 years of Putin's rule before the war, it was a possibility. It's not anymore. Then, yes, the media were not free, but in this unfree space, there were some bubbles, some pockets of free media accessible to everybody. They were destroyed immediately. They were banned immediately in, in March of 2022. Then intellectual life has so many restrictions now that you cannot talk about the normal university process normal intellectual discussion. It, it's not existing anymore. It's all under total state control. Culture. Imagine that out of the sudden, dozens of the most famous artists are all leaving the country or when they stay in the country are not loyal enough to the war, so they're not supporting the war, have been banned from performing. The legends of Russian rock who were opposing the Soviet regime in the 70s and 80s and were playing rock music in the 70s and 80s have been banned for the second time in their life. How would you compare this current mood in Russian society, the restrictions, the suppression of free speech, free thought, to previous periods in Russian history? I remember late Soviet Union, which in many aspects is similar, with uh, underground culture, band musicians, strict ideology, strong anti-Western rhetoric. Uh, now it's in the worst in some respects. The political imprisonments, we have in recent years people sentenced to, to terms in prison of 9, 10, or even 20 and more years. It didn't exist before 2022 in Putin's uh, time. And now the main opponents of the regime, Alexei Navalny, was not only sentenced for 19 years for political uh, accusation, and then he died or was killed. So it, in, in many aspects, it seems harsher. Alexander Baunov speaking to James Kumarasamy. It's been more than a week since the Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny died in a Siberian jail. His family and supporters say he was murdered on the orders of President Putin, a claim the Kremlin denies. Mr Navalny's body had been kept by the authorities, but after a very public spat with Russian officials, it was handed over to his mother on Saturday. Here's our Europe regional editor, Danny Eberhardt. 
The fact that the body was handed over has been confirmed by Alexei Navalny's spokeswoman, Kira Yarmish. She said it's not clear when there'll be a funeral, nor whether officials will interfere with it. So whether it will indeed be the type of funeral the family wants and Alexei Navalny himself deserves. Alexei Navalny's allies have said that his mother, Lyudmila, has been blackmailed, basically, to try to hold a funeral in secret without mourners. So that may still, of course, happen. We don't know. It's also not clear whether there'll be an independent or Topsy conducted. Uh, we've seen a lot, haven't we, in recent days of uh, Alexei Navalny's widow, Yulia, and earlier she released another hard-hitting video. Yeah, this was an absolutely extraordinary six-minute long attack, a very personal, uh, excoriating comments. She was dressed in black, she spoke directly to the camera from exile, I hasten to add, in Russian, and she accused President Putin again of murdering her husband and of torturing both him in life and death and his mother. She also challenged challenged the Russian leader very directly on his public displays of professed devotion to Russian Orthodox Christianity. She spoke over images of President Putin gazing at icons, kissing relics, even getting into a pool cut in the ice for a dip for Epiphany. The pool was in the shape of the cross. She said all this was fake, especially when you're considering how he had treated her husband's body, accusing him of Satanism. And we'll hear this from her now. Вера это не Faith is not about kissing an icon. Faith is about goodness, mercy and salvation. And no good Christian could ever do what Putin is now doing with the body of Alexei. Alexei was a religious man. It was important to him. He went to church, he fasted, even in prison. His policy and beliefs are largely based on Christian values but faith has nothing to do with Putin's obscurantism. The YouTube video itself, in the first eight hours, had accrued more than one and a half million views. We don't know how many of those were in Russia itself. The Kremlin has called accusations of President Putin might have murdered Alexei Navalny hysterical. It doesn't want him to be more of a martyr to the Russian opposition than he already is and doesn't want his body to be a focus for public dissent. Danny Eberhard there. Police in the Austrian capital Vienna are investigating the killing of four women and a girl in two separate incidents in 24 hours. Three of the victims were stabbed to death in a brothel. Bethany Bell reports from Vienna. In a statement, the Vienna police said they'd arrested a 27-year-old man who was found hiding in the bushes near the brothel with a knife in his hand. The suspect has been questioned and investigations continue. In a separate incident, police are searching for the husband and father of a woman and her daughter who were found dead in their flat. Investigators suspect the father may have strangled them. Austrian campaigners have called on the government to take urgent action to stop violence against women. Bethany Bell reporting. Of all the documentary films nominated for an Academy Award or Oscar this year, it's fair to say that To Kill a Tiger is perhaps the most harrowing in terms of subject matter. The title suggests it's a wildlife film. In fact, it's about an Indian farmer's struggle to seek redress for his young daughter, who was raped while attending a family wedding in a North Indian village. One of her attackers was a cousin. Statistics reveal a woman is raped every 20 minutes in India and about 90% of these crimes go unreported. Nisha Pahuja is the director of To Kill a Tiger and told Julian Warwicker more about the film. It is literally about a father who decides to seek justice after his 13-year-old daughter is, is sexually assaulted by three men. The villagers want him to marry her to one of the men who raped her and The entire family stands firm, including her. And she, in some way, really is the moral heart of the film. Her recognition that she deserved justice never wavered. And that is the strength that carried both her father and and her mother to the end. You mentioned the attitudes they came against in the village. How widespread were they? I mean, was that very much a majority view? Oh, yeah. And I would say probably in that region, yes, that would have been the majority view. The people in the community, including the families of of the boys, did not condone what their sons had done. They just didn't want their sons to be punished. 
because they didn't understand the severity of what they had done. There's definitely an attitude of, you know, she brought it upon herself. She's also to blame. And in taking the stand that her father did, that Ranjit did, uh, I mean, how big a risk was, was he taking? Well, in this particular case, the stakes were life and death. Fortunately, it didn't come to that. I think he did it for two reasons. I mean, obviously because of the love of his child. But I think Ranjit fundamentally, as a human being, is someone who has a really strong sense of, of human rights, a need for equality. I think there's just something about him that's very special. There were death threats, weren't there? Yeah, but we only sort of talked about one in the film, but it happened more than once. You know, there were the death threats, there were the offer to pay bribes, there was cajoling, kind of emotional blackmail, there was obviously the social ostracization. There was a lot of pressure on him to drop the case. Which he never did. What eventually happened to the rapists? They were sentenced. The case is now at the high court, but the men are still in prison. How do the villagers feel? They have a respect for Ranjit now because of the fact that he didn't back down. Uh, The fathers of the boys are are speaking to Ranjit. They're on talking terms again. His daughter was 13 when she was attacked. She's 20 now and she does eventually appear. We see her, don't we? Yes. The reason that she chose to come forward was to celebrate her courage. She was sort of in awe of her 13-year-old self when she watched the film. It is about removing the stigma of shame that surrounds survivors. She's done nothing wrong. It's so important that she is willing to kind of step forward uh, and be proud of what she achieved. What does this film say, do you think, about the wider issue of violence against women in India? I like to think of it as something that speaks to the larger issue of violence against women around the world. And I do think that that's one of the reasons that the film really resonates for people and it really resonates for women. It's because I think there's not a woman on the planet or a girl on the planet who doesn't walk through the world feeling that her body can be violated at any moment. I've had many people reach out to me from the United States and the UK and France who talk about the court system and what they've had to navigate and how frustrating it is. And the experience of watching Kiran was so familiar to them. What she went through is not just what a girl or a woman in India goes through. It's what women and girls go through around the world. Nisha Pahuja, director of the Oscar-nominated documentary To Kill a Tiger. Still to come on the Global News podcast, amid dwindling support, South Africa's governing party launches its election campaign. We will tackle the high cost of living, invest in our people, defend democracy and advance freedom. The UN Agency for Palestinian Refugees, UNWA, has suspended its aid deliveries to the north of Gaza amid increasing reports of pockets of famine in the territory. Here's our Middle East analyst, Sebastian Usher. The amount of aid getting into Gaza has been far lower in the past few months of war than it was before. The situation has been especially bad in the north. Very little aid of any kind has been able to get through to Palestinians still living in the area that was first to come under all-out attack in Israel's ground offensive against Hamas. The World Food Programme suspended its operation there a few days ago for security reasons. Now UNRWA has done the same. It says that convoys can't get through safely, in part because, in the agency's words, hungry Hungry and exhausted people have been trying to seize aid from the trucks. UNRWA has stressed that it doesn't blame the Gazans themselves, but the desperate conditions in which they're living. Sebastian Usher. The Hamas-run health authority in Gaza said more than 100 people were killed during airstrikes on sites including Khan Yunis and Rafa over the latest 24-hour period. As Israel's bombardment of parts of Gaza continues, negotiators have returned from talks in Paris reportedly with an outline of a ceasefire deal. With more on that, here's Jenny Hill in Jerusalem. In Israel, reports suggest significant progress made that the delegation has come back with what's being described as the outline of a deal upon which further negotiations can then continue. So what we don't know at this stage is how basic that framework is, but it is due to be presented to Israel's war cabinet at some point this evening, and they're due to vote on it. Now, in the meantime, a senior Palestinian official has told the BBC that actually no real progress has been 
been made and has accused negotiators of, in effect, trying to leak what he says inaccurate information in order to put pressure on Hamas. What we do know is that over the last week or so, there does seem to have been a little bit of a shift. We've gone from last weekend when you had Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, saying that Hamas's negotiating position was delusional. A few days later, one of his ministers was saying, actually, there are preliminary indications of a possibility towards progress. During the week, Hamas's political leadership met with Egyptian officials in Cairo, and Washington's senior Middle East envoy was also in both Egypt and Israel, where he held talks with Benjamin Netanyahu before the delegation went to Paris for these talks. Um, I think the negotiators feel pressure because the US wants to get a deal done before Ramadan, which begins on March the 10th. And of course, Israel has said that if its hostages are not returned by the start of Ramadan, it will go ahead with those plans for a major ground offensive in the southern city of Rafah, where well over a million Palestinian displaced civilians are sheltering. Jenny Hill in Jerusalem. Britain's governing party has suspended the parliamentary membership of a high-profile MP after he claimed that the Mayor of London was, in his words, under the control of Islamists. Lee Anderson, previously one of the Conservative Party's deputy chairman, made the comments on live television. The remarks drew this response from London's Mayor Sadiq Khan, who is himself a Muslim and a member of the main opposition Labour Party. These comments from a senior Conservative are Islamophobic, anti-Muslim and racist. And I'm afraid the deafening silence from Rishi Sunak and from the Cabinet confirms to many people across the country that there's a hierarchy when it comes to racism. I think it's really important to call out anti-Semitism, misogyny, homophobia, but surely it must also be important to call out anti-Muslim hatred. For more on this, I've been talking to Katie Balls, political editor of the conservative-leaning Spectator magazine. I've spoken to some Tory MPs who want to speak out about what they see as Islamist extremism, but they feel as though Lee Anderson's comments come across as anti-Muslim rather than anti-extremism. So I don't think he has many defenders, but of course there are some Tory MPs who have not commented. And you could still see, I think, some support for Lee Anderson in parts of the party because he is quite a popular figure. And particularly with the 2019 intake, he is seen as someone who often in the past is praised for his straight talking. And to a point, Rishi Sunak quite liked the fact that Lee Anderson was straight talking and a little bit controversial. He made him deputy chairman of the Tory party in part for that reason. But of course, the risk is you're never too far away from a controversy, which is actually quite hard to come back from. And that's what's happened here. What does all this say, Katie, about the state of British politics and society? Well, I think we saw this week in the House of Parliament how charged the mood is right now when it came to an opposition day motion on a ceasefire in Gaza and the Speaker changing convention because MPs were worried about harassment from groups if they voted in certain ways. And the situation in the Middle East is heightening tensions here. Rishi Sunak is hoping by taking this decisive action, be it the next day, they're drawing a line and saying, actually, there is a line that you cannot cross when it comes to some of the language, some of the debates we'll be having. I think there's a question now as to whether this does split the Tory party and whether he now potentially defects to a party further to the right, such as reform, I think this debate is going to still be quite messy for some time to come. Do you think he is likely to defect? I think the question is, is there a way back for Lee Anderson to become a Tory MP again? But also, if there isn't, the problem he might have is we know the Reform Party has tried to convince MPs like Lee Anderson to step across. And you could argue Lee Anderson doesn't have much to lose right now. So I think it's definitely a possibility. Katie Bowles of The Spectator magazine. South Africa's governing ANC has launched its election campaign, hoping to overcome anger about high unemployment and a weakening economy. Polls suggest the party could lose its parliamentary majority in the election on the 29th of May for the first time since the fall of apartheid 30 years ago. At the launch of the ANC's election manifesto, President Cyril Ramaphosa promised to build on what he called the successes of the last three decades. Our Africa regional editor Richard Hamilton reports. In power since the first democratic elections in 1994, the ANC has recently suffered a sharp decline in support, beset by allegations of corruption and mismanagement. But inside a packed football stadium in Durban, you wouldn't have noticed.
President Ramaphosa insists that if South Africans keep voting for the ANC, things can only get better. We will tackle the high cost of living. We will also invest in our people. We will defend democracy and advance freedom. And we will continue to build a better Africa and a better world. But with an economic slowdown, high unemployment, crime and persistent power cuts, the audience outside the stadium may feel these promises are beginning to sound a little hollow. The main challengers in the next election are the Democratic Alliance, which was always seen as representing white conservative voters, and Julius Malema's economic freedom fighters, which has a more radical agenda of seizing land and nationalising mines. But most black South Africans are still profoundly grateful to the ANC for liberating them from apartheid. And despite dire predictions in the opinion polls, the ANC remains a formidable election-winning machine. So reports of its demise may be greatly exaggerated. Richard Hamilton. Now... Can you believe he said this? That's the caption of Georgia Bull's viral video in which the professional female golfer is given unsolicited advice by a random man. The TikTok post has resonated with those who watched it, with many people sharing their experiences of mansplaining, which refers to men dishing out unnecessary advice to women in a condescending manner. Anna Aslam can tell us more. Georgia Ball spends a lot of time at the driving range, practicing her swing and posting coaching videos on social media. As she sends the ball flying into the distance, a male voice off camera repeatedly chips in with unsolicited tips. Excuse me. What you're doing there, you shouldn't be doing that. You know, I've been playing off 20 years. What you need to do is, is follow through a lot quicker than what you're doing there right now. The professional golfer looks taken aback, but thanks the unknown man, explains that she's changing her swing and hits a perfect shot. Which the man then takes credit for. Georgia told the BBC it was an awkward conversation, but she didn't feel comfortable shutting it down by pointing out that she's a pro. I'm quite a humbled person, so for me to turn around and say, I am a PGA pro, I know what I'm doing, it's just not in me to do that. The 90 second video has been viewed more than 10 million times, and while many people have commended Georgia for taking the moral high ground, there's no shortage of comments wincing at the mansplaining. Fellow professional golfer Julie Walker says it's a common problem in the sport. Whenever you play in mixed competitions, there generally is somebody in the company who's deciding that they can give you some advice. That's that's um, They're very good at that, male golfers. It's very much a male-dominated sport. It is also very, very traditional in its nature. Therefore, it attracts people who like tradition and like rules and um, like women to be contained within some rules. Georgia says golf is a beautiful game and should be a welcoming space for everyone. She sees the funny side of the situation, but has this advice for people who may feel the urge to impart wisdom to strangers. We're all going through our own challenges within the game. So, you know, if you've seen someone struggle, just think they are going through a change and maybe just be a little easier on on everyone, especially when you're on the drive.